Well hello again, it's Cliff here from Down Under. In this video series, I want to go through making the Hallmark ITTP Pro bodies as an example of medium scale batch production. So it's going to be parts production from small CNC machines like the Tormax. So I'll start right at the beginning with the raw material and setting it up in the Tormac lathe and machining one end, spinning it around, machining the other end, setting up the tools and discussing all the little tips and tricks along the way. Then the next stage will be setting it up in a little three axis mill, machining the top portion or the end portion of the body, setting it up the next if, it, if you like, it's a video book, but a hands-on book. There could be chapters or episodes. The next chapter might be uh, doing the fourth axis machining and so on. So I'll, I'll go right from the beginning. Hopefully I'll get as far as the final part. And it'll be a great opportunity to demonstrate different setups, different machining techniques, tips and tricks along the way. And I'll also mention other videos that are relevant so that you can go through and find those in the uh, Thread Express YouTube uh, playlists. Well, before we get down to the nitty gritty of each chapter or episode, I'll put in a quick montage, just giving you an overview of what these videos is about. So you can put it in context and see where it's all going and where you have been before if you've watched other episodes just to bring it all together at the beginning of each video. Cheers. So now I'll go into the subject of setting and holding your parts and setting your work offsets. So you can see here I'm using three reverse jaw, three jaw chucks. They're really useful multi-purpose fixturing uh, tools. So if you mount them on their backs, um, they repeat very well for concentricity and Z height, which is what I need for holding these round parts. And you can make up some simple little clamps, for example, these little clamps here that are machined to take up the difference in the height of the chucks. So you just need to make a little note or engrave something on the chuck, which way around it goes, and then you can quickly uh, clamp your chucks down using those little bridging clamps and a little step clamp on each end and you can mark all the mount all the chucks roughly in alignment so that all the chuck keys are to the front and they're in the right rot rotational alignment to clear your cutters and so on um, so they don't have to be in exact alignment because you're going to set each chuck with its own work offset using your probe so uh, 
this is a very efficient multi-purpose fixturing system that I use on quite a few uh, different part production jobs. So we're going to machine three parts one after the other and that gives me much longer automatic running time. So we're going to set each part up on a different work offset. So this is going to be G54, G55 and G56 and the code can be set up to suit that either by using subroutines which is a little bit of clever G code that you would need to learn or to copy and paste each section of code one after the other. For example, per tool, I would do this one G54, then this one G55, then this one G56. We copy and paste those sections of code together, then move to the next tool, G54, 5, and 6, and so on. Whichever way uh, you find easier. The uh, subroutine method is more elegant and has less code, but you need to learn how to do that first. So now I'm just going to set my work offset to G54, put in the probe, find the center, and probe the Z. So now we've set the work offset for the first part, G54, and then I'll move over and do the same on the second part and the third part, G55, G56. Now each time we put a part in there, it's going to repeat that position because the chuck, even if it has errors in it, there'll be consistent errors, and it will always be tightening up on the same diameter, and it will put the part back in the same place each time. So the setup required is only once and then the production can begin three parts at a time. So now we've positioned over the next part we're going to call this G55 let's just go through this on the control software so you can see we're currently on G54 there so we just put in here the data entry G55 enter now we're showing G55 there and we go to our probe page and we're going to go rectangular circular and we're going to use this one here find center, I'm going to click on that button So now it's parked over XY0 and you can see for G55 we have XY set on 0. And we're going to come over now and set the Z, come here to XYZ and this button here, probe Z set work origin, we're going to push that button. And as easy as that, we've set the work offsets for that middle part. And then we'll index over and do the same for the last one, calling that position G56. Okay, so I've just set G56. And you can see on the toolpath display, the three parts are shown set up there. The toolpaths for the three parts is shown there in a row, pretty much as it is there. That's just confirming that you've got it correct. Well, this is just a quick overview of production machining via multiple parts and multiple work offsets. If you're interested in the details of this, have a look at my specific videos. It's a good idea to top up your lubrication system. There's a lot of vertical movement on pick drilling all of those holes and the Z slideways going up and down all day long. Um, don't ever completely trust your internal lubrication system because uh, it can easily become blocked 
or broken and all the oil can come out of one or two easy ports instead of all of the different important little passages and so you may not know that it's broken and that your oil is not going where it needs to go it's a good idea to back up the key areas I've got this little um, bit of heat, heat bent tube that I put on the end of my way oiler and I get up there and lubricate the vertical slideways and the vertical screw and run that up and down the ball screw and you can feel it going click 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 and discharge a bit of oil onto it um, and that way it's draining down through the vertical slideway and ball screw system while the machine's running. Let me show you that now. So I get in there on the ball screw I can feel it clicking up and down there put a bit on the dovetail slides on either side and that way the oil is draining down through the slideway system as the machine runs just to back up in case the internal uh, pressure system is not working I've had those machines apart and I know that they are like any machine not a hundred percent and that quite often the oil all comes out of one or two places and not evenly throughout all the different points so uh, have a look on my YouTube channel, Thread Express. Click on the playlist and you'll see uh, videos specifically on machine maintenance. So going into the tool paths in a bit more detail, the 6mm end mill cuts the retraction slots, these ones, and the location spigot here on all three parts. Then it changes to that D-bit chamfering tool and spots all of the holes to start the drilling position and also chamfers these uh, profiles and the chamfers this uh, spigoted area then the drill goes in and drills right through on these holes these six holes the pogo holes and there's clearance there where the jaws are not present and then goes down and drills uh, blind holes down here for the threaded 3mm threads that hold the end caps on. So it's quite a lot of machining in this operation and it runs automatically for quite a long time so I can go away and do something else. So I've just stopped the uh, program after making the first running the 6mm uh, cutter on the first part so that I can check it. If there is a problem, I don't really want to make three rejects. So we'll just check that out. So I've machined the spigot on the diameter and uh, measured that up and that seems really good. And the deep slots for the impact tol tolerance retraction groove, they seem really good. And you can see uh, to get the stiffness I've gone to a fairly big cutter there um, and that precludes the ability to use adaptive roughing um, and more, I have to use a more conventional machining technique which isn't ideal I would rather use adaptive roughing but if I use a small cutter that allows adaptive roughing then by the time it's projecting 29 millimeters out it's just getting too flexible and so there is a point where conventional machining is the best option and um, this works perfectly well just going down uh, from memory about three millimeters C steps each time um, there's not a lot of sideways adjustment there but it seems to cut really well the main thing is to have a very good jet of coolant to keep the chips coming out so that it doesn't clog up in there and uh, keeps cutting freely 
obviously if it starts to clog up in there, especially with this cutter uh, not being uh, having flutes ground the whole way, it would jam in there and uh, get between the shank and the uh, part and actually could even shift it in the chuck and we would have a at least a reject if not a disaster. So you've got to keep on top of these sort of problems, um, anticipate them and avoid them, check them as you go so that if you are having a problem you're not going to make a whole lot of rejects before you discover what that problem is. I know some of you will be thinking, well, why is he not using an automatic tool changer? He's clearly doing production work and has been for several years. What's going on? Um, if I had to summarize quickly without taking too long, both my machines are TTS. They're not BT30. And um, there are problems with TTS in an automatic tool changer situation. I've had lots of emails and read forums and uh, seen comments posted that keep repeating the story that the, there is accuracy, uh, repeatability and long-term reliability issues with a TTS auto tool changer if you're doing high precision work that needs to run automatically and um, that's the type of work I'm doing. So I've just got a bit wary about it and um, I, I, I would want to have a a uh, automatic tool changer system that could run all day and all evening unattended and um, I'm just not confident that TTS is the right spindle type for that type of work and so I've improved on um, efficiency by having multiple parts and this is a similar way that you can increase the productivity and the automatic runtime duration by having multiple parts so that you each tool is running for in this case three times longer and allows me plenty of time to go away and do something else so that I'm doing two jobs at once and that improves the efficiency of the production via that method without me having to change to um, say BT30 in a more expensive uh, machine. All right. well thanks for watching that episode or chapter Hopefully you found something useful in there. And if you did, please like and subscribe. That helps with the YouTube algorithms, as you probably know, which brings it out there to more and more viewers. Um, please uh, stay with me, and I will be editing and completing the next chapter or video and publishing it soon. Thanks for watching. Cheers.